Listeners, beware. This podcast contains themes of the macabre and does not shy away from the details. Our content is graphic and our language is colorful. We might not be your cup of tea, so listener discretion is strongly advised. Welcome to Season 3, Episode 6 of The Killer T. Today we'll be discussing Delfina, Carmen, and Maria Luisa Gonzalez Valenzuela. Las Pocayanti. We are your hosts, Christina. And Chelsea. If you guys don't want to hear us make excuses to you, then just skip ahead five minutes because I feel like we owe an explanation. We've been gone since June. I had a newborn and Chelsea was becoming a surrogate and she moved into her brand new dream home. Both of our businesses are flourishing, so we got very behind. We kept saying we needed to record, but honestly, this is a hobby for us. So this is the thing that goes on the back burner. And we miss doing it. We miss you guys so much. It would be a dream come true to be able to do this full time. But in the meantime, we are so excited to announce that we got a lot of hate mail while we were gone. So many angry YouTube comments. Yes, all by men telling us how annoying we are. I feel like I've done it. I've made it. Can we at least be constructive in our criticism? We got called Karen. Yeah, if someone wants to explain that to us, we'd appreciate it. Is that a Karen thing? I feel like that's a Karen thing to say. A few major things happened in the true crime world while we were away. Yes. First and foremost, we have to discuss the fact that they are fairly certain they have figured out who the Zodiac Killer is. Oh my God. Talk about a major true crime breakthrough. That is pretty incredible. And from my understanding of the information that was actually put out there, this is almost guaranteed that it is. They are very certain. They used the person's name to solve the ciphers. Yes. I am very curious to see how all of that continues to unfold. Well, and we have not covered the Zodiac yes. Killer yet. We've been holding off on the Zodiac, and I'm glad that we did. Me too. Because by the time we actually get to the Zodiac, I feel like we'll have so much more information. Of course, the other major thing is everyone is talking about laundry. laundry. Ugh. Sounds like a gigantic pile of shit. But if there are any positives that could come out of this situation, it's that missing, murdered Indigenous women are now part of the national conversation. And that's not something that has happened ever. And lastly, before we move on to the episode, I did just want to give an update on the Sarah Everdyard case, which even though is not a serial killing, it was part of an international dialogue that is really, really important. So if you're unfamiliar with Sarah's case, this happened in March of 2021, earlier this year. She was walking home when she was approached by an off-duty police officer who made up a bullshit lie of she was violating COVID protocol and he arrested her in his rental car drove her to dover where he raped strangled and potentially dismembered her body also burning the remains and getting rid of them in a pond the officer who arrested her was wayne cousins and he was actually (laughs) arrested in 2015 for indecent exposure and the police force in the uk did nothing about it, did no more investigation into it. It's very likely that this was not his first murder. As of September 30th, Wayne Cousins has pleaded guilty to the kidnap, rape, and murder of Sarah Everyard and was sentenced to a whole life order, which is essentially the UK's life without parole. If it does turn out that Cousins may have had other victims, we will look into updating more on this case and potentially doing a deep dive. It hasn't even been an entire year, so I'm 100% certain more information is going to come in the following months to years after this case is concluded. 
By the way, major props to our good friend Tara, who was on several episodes in both the first and second season. She actually took over doing some note-taking for us in the next couple episodes and majorly saved our butts. Yes. She's been amazing. So, T, if you're listening, you to bomb. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Without you, we would not be recording right now. Yes. <laughs> that is, in fact, true. <laughs> Let's be real. The Gonzalez Venezuela sisters were four siblings. The oldest was Delfina, born in 1910. Carmen was born in 1920. And Mary Luisa, or often called Eva, the leggy one, born 1921. And finally, Maria de Jesus Chewy, born 1922. Born into poverty in the state of Jalisco and growing up under the tyranny of their father, Isidro, He was a police chief, but was known as a violent and authoritarian man. It is reported he would lock his own daughters in the jail cells for wearing makeup or risque clothing. Violent beatings would accompany these punishments. What? He also used his power as chief of police to threaten locals and procure bribes for his family. He sounds like a real peach. And everything that I read and watched, because I watched a lot of YouTube, He was kind of a gangster, and the abuse that his children suffered from him. I mean, what could they possibly be wearing in 19, 20, 30 that is revealing or scandalous? Uh, Not that, I mean, this is definitely setting the tone for the girls' future behaviors. Yeah. Not much is known about their mother, but it can be assumed that if their father would abuse his daughters in such a horrendous way, that the mother probably had to go through some pretty brutal treatment. And unfortunately, she did not and could not do anything to stop the abuse of her daughters. Right. I mean, if he's abusing his daughters... He's abusing all of them. He's abusing all of them. Let's, Let's be real here. As police chief, their father would frequently cruise around the village to make sure that everything was okay, you know, patrolling. But one day in 1921, an argument broke out between him and another man, and he shot and killed the man dead. He then rushed home to get his family to flee to a different city for fear of his victim's family retaliating against him. They would later settle in San Francisco del Recon, and this is where the Sinister Sisters would start their own careers. Having started their lives in the poverty of El Salto, the girls were really driven to not be in poverty any longer. And as they grew up, this would drive them to start their own businesses in town, which then led to them opening a bar. This didn't make them rich, but it did provide enough to feed them and their families over the years. This eventually led them to prostitution. The sisters would, quote unquote, bribe officials with their sexual skills to prevent the officials from closing down their establishments. Things must have escalated greatly (laughs) to go from point A to point B. That would lead the oldest sister, Delfina, to purchasing her own bar in 1938 in San Francisco del Recon and quickly began running an illegal brothel out of it. To obtain the girls she needed, Delfina would post ads for help wanted as maids or cooks. And if the girls were pretty enough, Delfina would then force them into prostitution. She would keep them underfed and weak so they couldn't escape or fight back Delfina was in a relationship with an army captain who was affectionately known as the Black Eagle, and he would help get working girls by kidnapping girls from local villages. All all of this is kidnapping. This is kidnapping, (laughs) and you're not letting them go. Meanwhile, Chewy purchased her own brothel in 1950, so clearly the sisters are like, this is a fantastic idea. idea. (laughs) They must have all known the inner workings of what each one of them was doing. So she buys her own brothel and purchased it from a homosexual man with the nickname of El Pocantis, which is what the locals would call the brothel and a name that Chewy absolutely hated. So she tried to change it to La Barco del Oro. However, the locals never called it that, and it soon became known as Las Pocantis, a name that would follow their sisters for the rest of their lives. We attempted to translate this name, and because it's a nickname, there isn't really a translation. 
I'm assuming they didn't like it or Chewy didn't like it because of the homosexual man. Maybe it's a reference to homosexuality. Yeah. She didn't care for it. But there isn't like a direct translation and we couldn't right. find one. Chewy followed her sister's example and submitted her kidnapped victims to the same deplorable treatment as her sister's. In 1962, the governor outlawed brothels, so Chewy was forced to take her girls and relocate to Dathena's brothel since it was in a different state. The nickname Los Pocantes still followed them back to Jalisco. The sisters would eventually come to own seven brothels in total, with the management split between them. Delfina, Carmen, and Chewy would co-manage the brothels in Guanajuato and Jalisco while Maria Luisa operated the locations closer to the Mexican border. The main location was located in San Francisco del Rican and was called Rancho Lomo del Angel, which translates to Angel Hill. But we also saw this translated to Graveyard of Angels. What would become to be known as the Bordello from Hell, which makes me think of the Bordello of Blood from Tales from the Crypt. Yeah. <laughs> but the girls that worked here were known as angels and lived in deplorable conditions similar to those of concentration camps. So if you think about that, I mean, this that's, is that's this a is bad. pretty severe comparison. Many of the girls that were forced to work here were kidnapped, again, by the Black Eagle, Delfina's boo, boo, or hired from the Help Wanted ads, the girls were force-fed heroin and cocaine to keep them from leaving, offered almost no food, forced to sleep on the floors, or were locked into tiny rooms. The virgins were kept separate to sell to the highest bidder, while the rest were beaten savagely, raped, and sometimes showered with ice water as initiation to the ranch. This is the most disgusting, deplorable. How could another woman do this to any human being, let alone other women. And it gets worse. The treatment gets worse. Yeah. After the sister's arrest, some of the surviving angels came forward to share about their experiences. And they described the beatings and the torture they endured as follows. Frequently after a day of work, they would be forced to kneel and hold bricks at shoulder level for hours on end. There was typically no reason for any of the torture that the sisters thrust upon them other than the fact that they enjoyed it. However, the angels would also get beatings if they did not please their johns, which I'm assuming johns is like. Well, that's a slang term for the men that hire prostitutes. Oh, I did not know that. You didn't know that? No, I'm this far into true crime and I did not know that. Oh, yeah. A john is anyone who hires a prostitute. Well, shit. Okay, so if these women did not please their johns, their lives were hell. If you're hearing this going, okay, why not plan an escape? These women are there for an extended amount of time. Someone at some point has to have been able to get out of here. And the answer to that is it's so much more complicated than just waiting it out and getting out. These women are in fear of their lives. They are constantly being re-traumatized day in and day out. They're seeing the women around them who defy the sisters and their husbands or their beaus being murdered at their feet. A lot of them don't have a support system. They have no resources whatsoever. So part of this comes from having an actual real life dependency of needing a roof over your head and fear of your life, needing food in your belly. It's not as simple as just escaping. Even looking at sex trafficking through a modern lens in 2021, it is not as simple as just waiting for the dead of night and escaping. According to StoppingTraffic.org, 40.3 million people are enslaved worldwide with hundreds of thousands in the United States. 1% of victims will actually survive trafficking. That means 99% will never return home. 80% of survivors do not receive any help or resources for their recovery. According to research done by the Polaris Project, 81% are trapped in forced labor, 25% of them are children, and a whopping 75% are women and girls. Forced labor in human trafficking is a $150 billion industry worldwide. The U.S. Department of Labor has identified 139 goods from 75 countries made by forced and child labor. One out of six endangered runaways reported to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children were likely child sex victims. 
Of those, 86% were in care of social services or foster care when they ran. Polaris estimates that the total number of victims nationally reaches into the hundreds of thousands when estimates of both adults and minors in sex trafficking and labor trafficking are aggregated. That is sex trafficking through a modern lens. Imagine what it was in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. So yeah, in conclusion, if any of them dared to run away, they would be murdered. Prior to the end of Loma de Angel, Carmen died in the 1950s from cancer. Mm, I hope she suffered. The remaining sisters continued to run the businesses with the help of Delfina's lover and her son, Ramon Torres El Tepo. Both worked as muscle to help keep the girls in line. The men were vital in the horrors that occurred at the ranch. As previously mentioned, if the angels became pregnant via their johns, then the men would help beat them until they aborted the fetuses. If the girls became sick, including STDs, or could no longer work due to age or appearance, they were killed and buried on the ranch. I'm assuming so that way no one would figure out what was going on. Of course. Delphina's lover often handled the disposal of these bodies. And additionally, if any of the Johns that came to the ranch had lots of money, they would also be killed so the sisters could take their money. I don't know how anyone would think that eventually you're not going to be caught for this, but... <laughs> Herein lies the problem. In 1963, Delfina's son, Ramon, was at Loma del Angel when he got into a fight with some of the crooked cops that often frequented the ranch. Oh, crooked cops. Hey. During the fight, Ramon was shot and killed. In a fit of rage, Delfina demanded that her lover hunt down the cops that killed her son. All right, now we're going to go into, like, fighting territory. Shit's going to go down. So he did just that. This brought more attention to the sisters as they had pretty much bribed most of the local cops to turn a blind eye, but some of them were also not on her payroll or their payroll. And then they went and killed a cop, albeit a dirty cop, but a cop nonetheless. So if you're trying to fly under the radar, that is not the way to do it. A few months later, in January 1964, a kidnapped prostitute named Catalina Ortega managed to escape the ranch by a small hole in the back of one of the rooms. She ran, and Delfina ordered her husband to hunt her down. Before he managed to find her, Catalina had got back to her house, and with her mother, they went to the police. Good. Luckily, Catalina talked to an officer that was not on the sisters' payroll and told them what was going on over on the ranch. A warrant was issued for the sisters, and the police arrived at the ranch to find Delfina and Chewy dressed for the morning of Ramon Torres. The two sisters were arrested on January 14, 1964, and the third sister, Maria Luisa, was not on the ranch at the time and managed to avoid being arrested immediately. The officers found dozens of emaciated women locked in the rooms on the ranch. While they were taking many of these women out to safety, the girls would point to places on the ground and simply say, bodies. As the sisters were arrested and let out, they were met by a mob of angry villagers demanding that they be lynched and handed over immediately. Maria Luisa eventually turned herself in, not due to thinking that she was actually guilty, but because she feared the angry villagers would find her and kill her, which they probably would have. Probably. She believed she would be immune to charges because Catalina had not named her in her statement to police, but she was immediately arrested and charged when she showed up at the station. Zaniga was also arrested for assisting the sisters with their crimes, which is the baby daddy. Upon search of the property, a total of 91 bodies were found. 11 men, 80 women, and several fetuses were dug up with various levels of decomposition from the 14 years that the sisters were in the brothel. 14 years they got away with this. Dozens of the rescued victims came forward to share their treatment at the ranch from the sisters dabbling in the satanic acts, which you know our feelings on that. Forcing women to perform sexual acts on animals, ugh, torture, and they often witnessed the killing of several other girls. Additionally, several accounts of sexual bribery with state and local officials were revealed, which caused a local uproar and vicious riots against the police. I mean, these are consequences of your actions. Consequences of your actions. 
All three of the sisters were sentenced to 40 years in prison for their crime. Not enough time. No. Not enough time. Delfina, the oldest and, let's say, ringleader, ended up going mad in prison after only four years. On October 17, 1968, while she was screaming and throwing things at workers that were repairing a cell above hers, a bucket of cement was accidentally dropped on her head. Accidentally on purpose? Killing her instantly. She deserved way worse than that after only four years, but, you know, accidentally on purpose. Maria Luisa served 20 years before dying in prison in November of 1984. Her body was not discovered for days, leading to her body being partially eaten by rats by the time they checked in her cell. Ha! Okay. (laughs) Mexican prisons. (laughs) Wow. Wow. All right. (laughs) Maria de Jesus was the youngest sister and served an undetermined amount of time in prison before being released and then disappeared. No record is around to show when or why she was released before the end of her sentence. There's a local legend that says she met with a man while they both served time in prison and they were both released and they ran away together to live in obscurity. Hmm. In 2002, 38 years after the sister's arrest, while clearing the land of what once was Rancho Loma del Angel, For housing, 20 more remains were discovered. Forensics dated the remains from the 1950s to the 1960s, making them potentially even more victims of the Sinister Sisters. With the previous remains discovered, it would bring the body count up to over 110 victims. The Guinness World Records called them the most prolific murder partnership. 110. That was, um, that was a lot. So bear in mind, when we are looking for female serial killers, there are not a lot. The majority of the ones that we have information on are from the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, or they're women of legend at this point in time. And they're all mostly black widows. Yes. And technically, they are gang killers. That's true. But they weren't killing people that they were, well, they're sex traffickers. Yes. Well, who were the girls in Egypt? Because this reminds me a, a lot, lot of them. Of them. Yes. Oh, I know who you're talking about. That was Raya and Sakina from season two, episode like 10 or 11. And that was also very brutal. Yes. Those were sisters too. Yes. Holy shit, I what forgot is with about these sisters. That. What is with the sisters, man? What I was getting at when I brought this whole thing up was that When we are dealing with these older cases, a lot of times we have to make educated guesses, which does oftentimes deal with jumping to some conclusions. Educated conclusions, but conclusions nonetheless. And we do know that they were horribly abused their entire lives. And we do know that they were operating in survival mode in order to get away from that abuse. I think we do need to reiterate and reemphasize that more often than not, Childhood trauma is correlation, not causation. And you can have all the trauma in the world and not become a human sack of literal garbage that does torture and sex trafficking and murdering women and babies and all of that stuff. Childhood trauma is never an excuse to be a serial killer. Of course not. And survivalism is also not an excuse to be a serial killer. Yeah. You know, they wanted to start businesses to escape their father. And then they ended up doing worse monstrosities to other women after going through years of abuse from their father. Make it make sense. (laughs) Okay. There's some serious girl-on-girl crime. Bitches. Happening there. But anyways... Palette cleanser. Should we do our, our our little our little ditty? Palette cleanser. This is the palette cleanser. Speaking of serial killer memes, the new season of Dexter starts on Sunday. I don't know how I feel about it because I fucking hated Deb. Yeah, but Deb's dead. But Deb is back in the series. She's going to be his dark passenger that talks to him. Oh, I haven't really watched a lot of the previews. I I didn't care about, I didn't care. I didn't dislike Deb and I didn't like her. So I'm just excited for another season of my favorite fictional, fictional serial killer. The new season of You? Fabulous. We just finished it. Oh, good. I'm so glad. It was excellent. They can't give any spoilers to anyone, but. No. The way they ended it, though, was chef's kiss. Chef's kiss. I thought it was going to be a little stagnant. Very quickly did that turn around. Yes. Agreed. Okay, now on to some memes. 
It's a picture of American Psycho. Uh, yeah, Christian Bale. Yeah. You can't spell slaughter without laughter. My biggest fear is a serial killer saying funny shit while I'm trying to play dead. Yeah. Yeah. White people, when there's a new documentary about serial killers on Netflix, our time has come. <laughs> Introverted, but willing to discuss serial killers. When serial killer Rodney Alcala was on trial in 2010, he chose to act as his own attorney. He interrogated himself on the witness stand for five hours, oh asking questions in a deep voice and then answering them in his normal voice. And it says, because I'm Batman. Because I'm Batman. <laughs> it's one of those just girly things. Yeah. And it says, wanting a small tattoo that has a lot of meaning to you. And it shows a live, laugh, love tattoo on a wrist. And then underneath it, Richard Ramirez with the pentagram tattooed on his hand. Oh God. <laughs> Are you telling me you find serial killer humor funny? I do, and I'm tired of pretending it's not. The guy from Narcos sitting alone on a swing, and it says me sitting alone at the barbecue because no one wants to talk about Ted Bundy with me. <laughs> This is a picture of Ted Bundy. It says, according to a study, most serial killers are born in November. Tag a friend born in November. Let's help keep the world safe. Hi, I'm born and, in November. And my son is in November. And Rare your November. oldest is in November. Oh my gosh, this is so true. It's a picture of Homer Simpson in a Jason mask. And it says serial killers in movies. And then it's Homer Simpson's neighbor, the guy that wears like the green sweater and has the mustache. And it says serial killers in real life. <laughs> yeah, it's yep. that's not the fucking truth. So, uh, Dahmer scale, how are you, how oh, are you feeling just, about these ladies? 10 out of 10. I mean, just come gross. on. Just, just gross. Vile, horrible, disgusting human beings that... Yeah, I'm glad the, the cement fell and crushed that one. I mean, that's, like, that's karma. Yeah. Karma's a stone cold bitch. That's a 10 out of 10. Great execution. Wish I thought of it myself. Love Great. that for her. <laughs> and on that note, I think it's time to wrap up season three, episode six of The Killer T. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. We are back on schedule. We are excited to be here. And we've hired Tura to help us. To help us because Jesus Christ, we would not be doing this without her. Oh my her. God, we're so far behind. We do have at least three more episodes that we are ready to record. These will kind of still come out on time. Hopefully. Hopefully, fingers crossed. Mm. I know this episode is short. There's just not enough information to flesh out all the details to say someone in the 1970s. And especially in another country, too. There's lots of media available on Los Pocantes, but it's all in Spanish. A lot of those movies I saw came out in the 1970s. I tried to thumb through a few of them, but some of them didn't have subtitles. But that is Los Pocantes. All right. Like and follow us on all of our social media at The Killer T. Don't be afraid to drop a comment, leave a review, and be constructive in your criticism. All right. Until next time. Until next time. Bye. Join us in the next episode where we discuss Michael Madison. The East the Cleveland, East Cleveland Killer. Killer.
<laughs> she named him entitled asshole. <laughs> I love her.